All right, this is the second video where we're gonna talk about you know, how we got the data that we did, how we analyzed it, and uh, you know, some other factors that just didn't make it to the main video. But just FYI, um, this isn't the main video. That's on the regular Coffee Break channel. Uh, go check that out, the first link in the description below. So go watch that first before you watch this. Okay, so how do we collect this data? So as I sort of mentioned in the first video, this data was scraped using a bot, using the YouTube data API. It was done by Mitchell Jolly. It was scraped at the same time every day, uh, 9 a.m. GMT, I believe. Hey, future Steven here. I'm trying to throw this video together and I realized that uh, I forgot to tell you a few things about this. So um, the first thing is how this is structured. It's a unique video in that I'm trying to structure it sort of like with a table of contents in mind because I know a lot of you don't want to go through this whole thing. So in the pinned comment, I'm going to leave timestamps to the questions that I'm answering at different periods of time in this video. Um, also, if you think of anything that I didn't cover, please leave comments in the, the description. I'd be happy to answer some questions. The other thing that I didn't really talk about, really how you can get your hands on this stuff. Um, so I wanna cover that for a second here. So if you'll notice uh, that, that this is what we're now talking about. Okay, how you can get your hands on this data is there are three components you need to remake uh, this data set we did. And, and first you need Mitchell Jolly's original data set. So if you go to Kaggle, it, there's the link link in the description. Um, his Kaggle profile, you can just download all the CSV or uh, JSON files and you can get started there, okay? The second thing you need is my YouTuber classification, um, which was crowdsourced. It's in a CSV file as well. Go ahead and get that. That has all the unique channels that trended with what their classification is. Some of them were classified as NA, just so you know, um, because we couldn't find the channel or something like that. I think that's less than 1% of the data set though. And then the third thing you need is our Jupyter Notebook, um, which contains all the code to, to uh, run the analysis in the way that we did. If you're interested in doing your own work, you don't need that. But if you wanna see, if you wanna redo the work for yourself, um, that's what you need. Now, an important part of that is there is, you need to assign the path to, to wherever you're storing your files. So again, there should be a link in the description for how to download all our files there, but you need to make sure there's a part where it says, you know, your path here or something like that. Um, you need to go ahead and put in your file path in order so it accesses that. Um, other than that, everything else should run as planned. So that's pretty much it. I'm gonna get back to uh, you know talking about all the, all the limitations of this data set, all, all the things we did, all the things that I think about it that didn't make it to the main channel, um, but I just needed to get that off my chest. And um, as far as I know, there's only one hole in the data set as far as like the collection of it. I think Mitchell Jolly told me that he had gone away and when he came back for like part of this seven months, five days were missing, okay? So that's like the only hole in the data set. But other than that, this is this is by far and away the most data-driven look at the trending tab we've ever had. And I don't think those five days that we're missing is really too impactful. But there are some limitations to this data set that are worth mentioning, okay? So first and foremost, I think the most subjective part of this whole thing that you probably may want answers to is, is the data classification, right? So I classified, um, every single channel as being a part of some kind of category, whether that be a YouTuber, traditional media, a, mo a movie ch channel, trailer, music, conventional viral, et cetera. Um, and these were somewhat subjective categories that I created to try to capture the answer of, you know, how often does traditional media trend and how is it rewarded, et cetera. But these definitions are somewhat arbitrary and I can see people disagreeing with some of them, um, as well as the fact that some channels sort of fall in the cracks of like, which do they really belong to? Like Anthony Fantano, for example, I can see some people thinking, oh, he's a music channel. But at the same time, he's sort of a YouTuber. And so you have to make certain calls about like, well, is he more into like the music side or, but he's also like his main thing's YouTube. So how do you think about that? How do you think about someone who's reviewing music? So we classified him as a YouTuber, by the way. But my point is there's a small margin of error that's just necessarily gonna be part of any classification that is somewhat based on subjective definitions. So I, I posted the Excel CSV with all crowdsource classifications all available so anyone can publicly critique them, I, I don't mind. Anytime you're doing some primary research like this, people are gonna disagree, especially when some of it's subjective. So I just wanted to make that publicly available so people could see sort of what's going on. That's gonna be linked below. 
And another thing that I think could have introduced some error is just the 70 people I used to crowdsource this data. It was too much to classify myself, and I didn't have enough people interested in classifying to have a second round of people double checking the first group's work. Ideally, that's what it would have happened. I just didn't have enough interest on the second channel. Um, maybe after this video, people will be more interested in working on crowdsourced projects like this, but um, that's a limitation of the data set. Final limitation of the data set is that, look, this is a very limited window of time. This is from November 2017 to June 2018. Is it the best look at the training tab we've ever had? Yes. But do conclusions that were from a, a history based on a year ago, are they relevant to today? I would argue that they are, but you can't draw that strong of conclusions. So what I want to say here is that um, I'm aware that the algorithm changes. I'm aware that it's dynamic. So just bear in mind that the current state of affairs could be very different from what the state of affairs we saw a year ago, you know, whatever. Now let's talk about data visualization and analysis. So one of the first things we had to do with this data set was uh, we realized that a lot of videos trend over multiple days. So they would show up multiple times in our data set because the bot would pick them up, you know, Thursday and then it also pick them up Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, so what we decided to do was remove duplicates and we removed them such that only the first time it appeared on trending was what we captured and collected. Um, that way we could find out how many views did they have when they first appeared on trending. On that note, one of the assumptions we sort of make is that all videos who appear on trending, their views when captured were their views when they started trending. Of course, this is not exactly true. A video could have started trending at 12 a.m. and then only been seen on our data set at 9 a.m. when it was collected. So there's a margin of error there as well. I think it's rather small, but um, I just be aware that that happens. It's plus or minus like 24 hours, I guess, of when our bot picked it up versus when it was trending. Also, because we only collected once a day, there may be some videos that sort of slip through the cracks. Uh, just be aware of that. Like if they got on at 10 a.m., so our bot wouldn't have collected it, and they got off at 11 p.m. that night, we would have never seen that on our data set. So that's a limitation as well. But I don't see many solutions to this other than collecting like every hour on the hour. And I think that's just way too data intensive. Plus YouTube's data API limits the number of requests you can pull. So I'm not even sure that's a feasible project. Uh, I just wanted to state that this is a limitation of our data set. Um, now let's talk about data visualization. So now that we have our channels classified and we have our unique values, now what we wanna know is, you know, let's visualize this in some meaningful way. So what I was interested in is like the channels that are excelling. So I decided to check how many times is a channel trend, like, 0, 10, 15, 20, whatever. And then what's their average views when we catch them on trending? So what's their barrier to trending? Um, that's the graph you guys saw in the first video. But one thing I'll note is that some videos were not actually caught on that graph because they were so high up in the y-axis. I think David Dobrik, for example, like wasn't on our data set because he was at 17 million views before trending or whatever. And what was happening is our, our y-axis was so squished because it was trying to account for these like for these channels that were in the stratosphere. All of those channels like only trend once or twice. Um, but we decided to, to trim that side of the axis because we realized, okay, it's going to limit the, your ability to even see visually what what else is going on here if we include that. So we trimmed some outlier examples only on the y-axis uh, just to make the data more readable. That's just something I, I've got to be upfront about. Uh, one thing that I don't think I mentioned in the main video, we also sized the bubbles according to how many subscribers they had. That was like a cool way of trying to find out, does the number of subscribers you have make it harder for you to trend? Like, does the number of subscribers you have mean that you need more views before you get on trending? And the answer to that turns out to be no, because we see all those traditional media like ESPN, CNN, Colbert, Fallon, Kimmel, all of them have well into the millions of views and they're trending with only like 500,000 to a million views. So, so clearly this does not seriously impact your ability to trend at low numbers. But now let's talk about some things that might drive trendability, because I know in the video, all I talked about was views. Um, and obviously there's a lot more that could drive trendability. Maybe you have your pet hypothesis for why some people trend, some people don't. Um, and I tried to test a few common, common examples and common thoughts uh, to get an idea and none of them really worked, but let's run through them anyway. So one thing I, I thought was interesting is, does comments or likes or dislikes, some variable that's not views, have something to do with whether you trend? And the answer to that seems to be no, because what we find 
is that views are highly correlated with all those values. So like if you get a certain number of views, you're really likely to get the, some proportion, maybe 10% of those in likes, 0.1% of them in dislikes, you know, etc. So if likes and comments and dislikes were a factor, they would just be linked to views. And we don't see views as being too important of a factor to predict if someone trends. On that note, like when I say views don't matter that much uh, for trending, because I don't think they do, uh, let me give you an example, okay? So uh, one channel that I, I, I found as an example for this is the Associated Press who have who trend with really low numbers. Um, but what I found interesting is is uh, not just, you know, their numbers because I thought, well, maybe they just have a fast growth rate and they just get on trending early. Like maybe they just get all their views really fast and they jump on trending. Maybe it has nothing, maybe it's, there's no conspiracy, whatever. So here here's the Associated Press, the times they trend. It's seven times in total. And uh, what's weird is like some of these, like they trend with literally less than a thousand views. I don't know if you can see that. Um, they trend with less than at 748 videos when they trended with the raw seven South Carolina deputies, one officer shot. They trend with 748 videos. But what's weird about it and what I find strange is that it was published on the 16th. So it shows what time it's published. 16th of what is that? January, January, 2018. But when it actually trended was the 18th. So it's it was two days old, two days old when it trends with 700 views, 748 views in two days and it's on trending. Uh, that's what I mean. Like views don't seem to matter in some instances for trendability because it's like people are trending. Uh, they're not trending till they have 17 million views. And some people are trending when they have 700 views over two days. So it's it's really bizarre, honestly. Some of, some of these ch channels that are trending, it's really bizarre, and there's doesn't seem to be any silver bullet that makes that answers for all the facts. The other kind of uh, myth or thought that I thought I'd test out is whether the median number of views that a channel gets has anything to do with how many views they need to trend. My thought was, uh, I think even PewDiePie echoed this thought, but. It was a thought that I have that maybe like, let's say Coffee Break's average video does 10,000 views. Maybe for Coffee Break to trend, I only need 100,000 views because it's like tenfold. YouTube realizes I'm doing super well for my channel. So then they trend that video. Um, and that would make up for the fact that sometimes creators like PewDiePie, he'll get you know 10 million views on a video and it won't trend. And it's like, why? And this could explain it because it would be like, oh, well, he always gets 5 million views. So really his video is only doing two times better than it normally does. So to test this, I had a Twitter user who I will link right here, um, use the YouTube data, data API again to go ahead and pull the last 100 videos from all the creators that we see on trending. And so the idea there would be like, okay, let's check of their average views when trending against how many views do they normally get? What's their median views of about 100 videos? It took like 100 videos for a sample size. And we took the ratio. And my hope was that you'd see consistently like a video has to do 10 times better than its normal performance, than a channel's normal performance for it to trend. Uh, unfortunately, there was no relationship here at all. <laughs> you had a ratios of 100, like videos had to do 100 times better. You had ratios of 0.5, where like the video is doing half as well as its normal, normal comparison video and uh, it's trending. So there doesn't seem to be any relationship there. That was confusing. I thought that would for sure be like a really good insight. The final thing that I thought of was, I know YouTube often parrots the line that, hey, we're not checking out what's trending on YouTube. We're checking out what's trending around the world. So my thought was, maybe we can check Google Trends, which shows you how often a, a certain keyword gets searched. And we can check that and we can say, okay, if something's getting searched a lot, it's more likely to trend. Um, so for this, I checked out the channel Refinery29, which is sort of our, an outlier in our project. It trended about 40 times over a very specific window of time, about three months. It was very strange trending circumstances. So I thought, okay, let's check out the Google Trends searches for Refinery29. And when you do that, unfortunately, we don't get a great um, take here because they trended about between... November, when we first saw them start to trend, but and then we saw them trend to about March. In that time frame, we don't see them search that often on Google. And so my conclusion, well, I only did a very preliminary look at this kind of thing. I didn't see a strong relationship with the channel being like super likely to trend. It trends a whole lot. Um, I didn't see a relationship between that and them being searched a lot more on Google. Now, all of this being said, um, I know 
that a lot of you are sort of going to be like, oh, you could have done so much more. There's so much more to explore here. And to that, I totally agree. This was a preliminary research at best, and I look forward to passing the baton on to other people who can do further research into this. I didn't want to dive too deep into the nitty gritty of what some sometimes I think my audience isn't too interested in, but I did want to get a good glimpse of like, just so I could understand, how does trending work? But I'm not going to pretend that this is the end-all, be-all take on this. Obviously, YouTube's promised to change their algorithm. Obviously, there's a lot more work to do here, um, especially in other countries. So I kind of pass it off to you. If, if, if you'd like to do more research in this, I left my Jupyter Notebooks, which has all the code to how all our graphs were created, um, as well as the fact that I left... Mitchell Jolly's data set um, in the description below. So you have literally everything you need to recreate all my data, my all my graphs, all my data. Um, you have all the data sets for all these countries and you have the way to basically generate these charts for any country you so choose. So if you're a YouTuber out there, you're looking for something fun to explore, I'd really recommend you take on this topic. I think there's so much that I didn't cover. Uh, there's so much more to do here and I just wanted to get the conversation sort of rolling on this. Also, I almost forgot, go check out uh, Ryan Hunter's website, Fair Trending. Let me show you that right now. Fair Trending is a website which is an objective ranking of the most popular videos. You can, if you go to the Learn More, it explains exactly how it does it. It's a transparent algorithm, which is really cool. Um, I found it to be really neat. And uh, yeah, it was, it was made by Ryan Hunter. He, I, I talked with him, I asked him some questions about uh, trending and, and he's an amazing guy. I know the site is still being worked on, but um, I'm really excited to see what he does with this. I think this could be a really cool um, place for, for YouTubers to go to see what's really going on. The other thing I want to talk about is Algo Transparency. Um, this is a website started by, what's his name? I don't know how to say his name. Guillermo Chasla. I'm so sorry, man, that I butchered your name. Um, he, he's an ex-Googler who started this website that's devoted to basically figuring out how the recommended algorithm works, sort of through the method of looking at black boxes that I talked about, which is because we don't know exactly how it works, instead we just look at output and then start making inferences with when we collect enough data. So this is a really cool website. Um, this is just sort of on the in line with thinking about YouTube algorithms. Um, so check this out. It will show you how many channels are recommending different parts of YouTube. And one of my favorite things is he actually maps out a lot of, oh man, it's so much DPI. Uh, he maps out a lot of the, of how YouTube works, like, and what, who's being recommended to what. And so this is the music part, this is cars. But basically, basically you can see he's tried to see what channels recommend what other channels. So like, popular MMOs is linked to FGTV, which is linked to gameplay, which is linked to Dan, Dan the man. Um, anyway, this is really cool stuff. If, if, if you like following people, follow him on Twitter or go check out his website, algotransparency.org. Um, all right, yeah. That's it. Hey man, listen to them chords, bass and them drums straight smacking off the wall. I was on the plane and the stewardess said that's foolishness. Over that beat, I can't wait to see what you